Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Stacey. I am an alcoholic. Grateful for another day. I'm not trying to get sober again. Um, I know I know we took a, a little moment of silence. I just I would like to pray the serenity prayer if we could, if that's okay. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The moment of silence was beautiful, by the way. I like it when it takes a long time, because it takes a long time for like God to seep in and for me to be okay with feeling him, right? Like that that wishy-washy feeling of the presence in God sometimes it doesn't always make me comfortable or it always hasn't made me comfortable so uh my sobriety date is September 19th 2011 um I just celebrated 11 years of sobriety uh my home group is Road to Recovery we meet on Friday night at Friday nights at 7 p.m in Cuyahoga Falls Ohio um It's a women's meeting. Uh, It's a speaker meeting. It's amazing. Please come. And we always go to fellowship after on Friday night. So come have dinner and uh, be with us. Uh, My sponsor's name is Christina G and she lives in Brexville, Ohio. Um, And I don't know, I don't know who made the rules, right? Uh, But somebody told me in order to get up here and do this thing, I have to have all three of those things. Like if I don't have a home group, then I'm homeless. And if I don't have a sponsor, then I'm probably sponsoring myself. And, uh, and the sobriety date is the only rule we really have. Uh, So, um, so yay that I I have all those things and I'm supposed to tell you about them. So uh, I don't ever plan for these things. Thank you so much, Janessa, for asking me. We This has been on the books for a while and uh, so grateful to be with you all tonight. And I, I love weekend meetings, right? Because I was not the girl that was going to go to a meeting on a Saturday night. Like, no, that was not the place to be. You got, come on, like, we got to get lives, really. But today it is my favoriteest thing to do. And it's the only place I want to be, you know? Um, so, uh, and also I want to give a shout out to the flyer guy. Like I, uh, so I'm going to start with this quick story, right? So Janesta is like, Hey, what, what do you want on your flyer? And when anybody ever asks me that I, I say contempt prior to investigation because I landed in AA at 16 years old and I got sober at 27 and I never quit going to meetings. So 11 years and I was at the club and I was at the meeting and I was around you people and I'd get three days, I'd get four days, I'd get two weeks, and then I'd go back out there and I'd come right back and revolving door over and over and over again for over a decade. And so absolute contempt prior to investigation. And so they offered that as an option, but it was worded different. It was worded like investigation without contempt. And I'm like, no, I I still don't have that. I still have a little contempt, you know, Uh, like I got, I got to question it or whatever, you know, so I'm going to tell this little story real quick. Um, uh, So contempt prior to investigation, right? Like, like I was so rebellious. I, I am, I am just naturally like questioning and you know, I I don't really think you guys know what you're talking about. Like all of that kind of stuff, like just, naturally had this chip on my shoulders to what people told me. And so there was, they used 11 years, 11 years around AA. And so I would call them crazy, you know, cause I'll call, I'll go to a meeting. I'll make you pay attention to me. Right. But, uh, and they would be like, read we agnostics and call me back. And they'd hang up on me because we'd been doing this for a really long time. So it'd be like, read we agnostics and call me back. And, um, and, uh, and they'd hang up on me. And I would wait. I would stew. Don't they know what's going on with me? How dare they hang up on me? I I would watch the clock and be like, oh, I think that might have taken me 20 minutes, blah, 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 blah. And and then call them back and was like, oh, that didn't work and never actually did whatever it was that they told me to do. I had so much contempt prior to investigation. And so this uh, spectacular inner resource, like that was the that that was on the list of topics and man spectacular because that's the goal the goal is this like can i tap in on a daily basis to this power this god this thing 
that lives inside of me and has always lived inside of me. And for whatever reason, Bill in the book talks about um, worldly clamors for what worldly clamors within me, worldly clamors without me that block the noise. You know, they, it blocks the noise from me tapping in to that spectacular inner resource and when i get quiet enough and when i get still enough and when i do this work enough i get to this place where i am a hundred percent tapped in um so i don't uh, i like to tell this story real quick just to know you know so my um uh, my mom right so i have a dad i have a mom right and so my dad years before he ever my, my dad is 15 years older than my mother um, and so years before he robbed a bank, went to prison, got out of prison, went to the halfway house, absconded from the halfway house, created an entire different identity, met my mother, married my mother under a false name, had my sister and I, and was living this life. And so I'm nine months old. My mother is 26 years old and I'm in the carrier and the FBI come and knock on the door and go, excuse me, are you married to blah, blah, blah. And he went back to prison and we never saw him again. And so in a day with two children under the age of three, my mother's life went upside down. She was a stay at home mom. She was doing the best she could. She was making homemade food. She, she was doing the deal. And in a day, she's a single mom with two kids under the age of three and not married to the man that she's married to. Um, so, yeah yay to know that right like so any any qualms that i have about my childhood my mom did the best she could with what she had at the time that she had all of us and my childhood was not safe or lovely or it was not safe it was not physically safe it was not sexually safe it was it was just not safe um by the time um i was in seventh grade I got sent away. I got shipped and put into the system and, and pretty much grew up in residential treatment and residential stayings. Um, so I just like to tell that story about my mother because my mother is a saint um, and, and she is amazing. And that relationship has been 100% mended today. Um, I don't remember my first drink. Uh, it was always around. It was always the thing. I was the kid on the bar stool mixing Bloody Marys for my grandparents. Um, it, there was no parental guidance at all. My mother was working and we had the run, you know, and so there was no parental guidance. So one time we stole all the beer out of the refrigerator in the basement and um, my uh, stepdad said, next time, leave me some. Like kids are better managed when they're, you know, whatever. That was what he would say. He was like, oh, you're better managed when you're a little tipsy. Like it just was, it was easier to do what he wanted to do with us drunk. And my childhood was not safe. Right. And so it was always a thing. It was always around. Um, the first time I remember the feeling that we get, the first time that I remember I'm going to do this as much as I possibly can, I was eight years old. My sister and I, we lived in Key West, Florida. My sister and I broke into a marina. We were with three older boys, and my sister got sick, and I didn't. So Key West, Florida, it's hot and humid. I got big, bushy, red hair before I knew what to do with products, and my sister got sick, and I didn't, right? And I could hang, and I wasn't the little tag along, and, and it, was, it was like I had arrived. I'm going to do this as much as I possibly can, and I'm good at it. That was my opinion, right? Um, and I was eight. I was eight years old. And so we go forth and, and my life goes forth and we move from Key West, Florida to Lupton, Michigan. It, it's not on the map. Lupton, Michigan is not on the map. Uh, it's the middle of nowhere. It's cornfields and it's fabulous in the summertime. But dead of winter, Key West, Florida, it was a culture shock. And I went a little crazy. Right. Um, and so by seventh grade, I'm insane. I'm, I'm a full-blown alcoholic. I'm drinking around the clock. I'm, 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 I'm getting caught at school with alcohol. I'm, I'm doing all of these things. Um, and then a bunch of things happened in succession, right? Uh, uh, we caught a field on fire. Like, I mean, not on purpose. We were smoking in the field and the field caught on fire, but they threw a lot of like arson terms around and I got charged with a bunch. They were like, oh my God, you know, because it was like the triad. Anyway, they thought I was a psychopath. Uh, so, uh, but <laughs> thank God that's not the case. Uh, 
And so um, I got sent. I, I was always in court. I was always in trouble. There were always people paying attention, but they weren't paying attention in the right way or whatever, right? And so one day I go to court and I don't go home. I get I get put in the belly chain and the in the shackles and I get sent off and I did nine and a half months in residential juvenile like baby jail like like just like locked down. You're in a cell twenty three hours a day and, and I'm and I'm eleven. I don't even know how old I was. Seventh grade. Right. However old you are then. Um, and I'm abandoned by everybody that already I didn't really like. And, you know, it's not safe and all of those things. And then when everything came out about what was happening to me in our home, nobody believed me. Um, and I was abandoned and it was just one more time. And so it's like, I don't care. I don't care. Why do you care? Right. Like my attitudes toward alcohol and my attitude towards people was why are you even paying attention and why do you care? I, I was I, I bristled with antagonism at people. You know, I do not look today the way that I did when I came in here. It, I, I was angry. I threw ashtrays at people's heads. I, you know, they would talk to me about God and I was so vulgar and so broken that I would say things like, you know, I spent enough time on my knees. Thank you very much. And I'm not praying, you know, where was he? What was he doing? He wasn't paying any attention to me like everybody else. And I was so angry and so mad, you know, um, so how I landed in AA um, uh, is that like, so what happened was I'm in this residential treatment center and I age out. They age me out. I'm 16 and nine months. I become an emancipated minor. There's this little old lady. She rents me a room. They give me state money and I'm supposed to go to high school and show up and get my money and go to high school and live in this apartment with this little old lady. And, and that's what I'm supposed to do and be this emancipated minor. Um, well, the little old lady was like, if you're not going to come home at a decent hour, don't come home. And I was like, oh, sweet. I thought I had to come here fabulous and so i just start showing up randomly to pick up my checks and go and i'm living on the streets in grand rapids michigan and and doing my deal and sleeping on couches and hanging out with friends at, at 16 17 years old and one of the friends that i was friends with in that treatment center i'm sleeping on her couch and her mom worked at the alano club um, and so it's like an AA club that's that's in Grand Rapids it's called the North Club. And her mom worked there. They had a kitchen. They did hot meals, all of that kind of thing. And so she worked at the North Club. She would come and pick me up and kick me and be like, if you're going to eat today, you better get up. And I would go sit at the North Club because somebody was going to feed me that day and I'd be all hungover and whatever. Right. And I have no idea what alcoholism is. I have no idea what AA is. I'm so smart. I thought the Alano club was a country club because they all called it the club. Right. And they came in at noon in suits and ties and went to these meetings and it was really, really clean. I didn't know it was really, really clean because they had all these community service workers, but it was really, really clean, you know? And so I thought it was like a country club, you know, I thought it was fancy. I flew in. It was AA. Anyway. So I'm hanging out at the club. And there's this big, long parking lot and like grass in the back and picnic tables. And I'm drinking at the, I'm drinking at the club. Like I'm always drinking. Why wouldn't I be drinking at the club? I don't know that this is AA. I don't know. I don't know anything. Right. And I, but I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm 16. I'm sitting on these picnic tables and I'm drinking at the Alano club. And these guys come up to me and my attitude, if you would approach me and been like, what are you doing? I would have been like, I'm not by the door. Why do you care? I'm, I'm, I'm way back here. You had to walk all the way back here to say something to me, right? Like I'm not by the door. Why do you care? And, uh, and that was my attitude at drinking, uh, at, like on a property, we don't have property, but anyway, right. Okay. So, uh, these guys come up to me and very different. They go, Hey, why don't you finish that up and come to this meeting? And I was curious and nobody had invited me anywhere in a really, really long time. It, that wasn't these like older women trying to feed me because I was a 16 year old girl living on the streets. Right. It wasn't these women that, you know, felt sorry for me and had these and thought I should go to church. Right. If it wasn't those women trying to save my life, I, uh, it, it, these guys came up to me and said, Hey, why don't you come to this meeting? And so I did. And I landed in room a at noon. Okay. Now I gotta, I get to pick on some people, please. So like Bob, Bob M up here and the Edmonds and the Simmons, right? There was a Peter, I'm sure, right? I'm 16 years old and this is room A at noon. All guys, 
all in their 40s to 50s. They didn't hold hands during the Lord's Prayer because they thought it might mean it was the cowboy meeting. And this is the meeting I land in at 16 years. I could not relate, right? I'm not alcoholic because I'm not male and I'm not 40. Right? I'm not, I'm not male and I'm not 40. I can't be alcoholic, right? You know, I'm only homeless by choice. Oh, the delusion. So I land in AA and I land in the middle of this group of men. And, um, and I start paying attention and they start talking to me about drinking and they start talking to me about alcoholism and, and I don't get it. Right. But I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention. Right. And the thing I notice first is that you guys get two birthdays in one year. That's the thing. Cause I'm not selfish and self-centered at all, but that's the thing I notice first is that you guys get two birthdays in one year and who doesn't want two birthdays in one year. So I pick my day. Okay. All right. We're going to do this. I'm going to pick my day. Not so I can get sober or know what AA is or know what alcoholism is just so that I can get cupcakes in a year. I don't know what I'm 16. Okay. So I pick one, one, oh, one, cause I think it's a cool day. I'll probably remember it. If you ask me, that was it. One, one, oh, one. And, uh, the first time I got any kind of time from picking that day, I remember consciously picking that day. And I remember why I did it. And the first time I got any kind of time was August 23rd of 2001. And the only reason I remember August 23rd of 2001 is because it's written in the cover of this big book, right? And, and, and I got some time then. I, got, I probably got six months to a year. I can't really remember how much time, but I got, a, I got some time. In it, but it had been eight months from me trying to pick my day till the time that I actually got any kind of time. So I'm going to do this thing. I do it all the time. And it's the medical definition of alcoholism. And I believe that it is so important. And when I finally understood what it says and what I'm actually powerless over, it changed my life. Right. And so here's the thing. So medical definition of alcoholism up here, we have um, the, the phenomenon of craving. When I put alcohol into my system, something chemically happens to me that sets off the phenomenon of craving. It's why the first one kills us because it chemically sets off that craving. And I don't have the phenomenon of craving if I don't drink. And when I'm drinking, I don't know that I have the phenomenon of craving because I drink through it. So the only story I have with feeling the phenomenon of craving is that I was in treatment because I was always trying to get sober. 10 years, 11 years in AA, and I never quit going to meetings. And I was always rallied. I mean, my life was nothing. I was homeless, living in my car, drunk, and you were the only friends I had. You were the only people that paid any kind of attention to me. You know, I'd get a job, I'd go to treatment, I'd do this thing, I'd rally, and I'd get three weeks, and I'd go back right back out to the races, and I'd be gone for two or three weeks a month, and I and I'd burn my life to the ground, and I, I mean, I was so low coming in to start, it wasn't much to burn, right? And 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 so I didn't make it out there very long because I didn't have any food and I didn't have any clothes and I didn't I'm living in my car and all of that, right? So I would show up at the North Club for cigarettes and a meal. I'd show up at the North Club and maybe maybe that Brian guy will let me take a shower today, right? Like maybe somebody will let me do some laundry, like that. That I would just show up and come back and, and start going and rally again. And so I get into this treatment center and I'm in this treatment center and we get this pass to go to church. And so we're in Grand Rapids. We walk to this church and I'm with one of the other girls that's in the house and we're sitting in the church and I've been around long enough to know that I'm supposed to tell on my head. Right. And so I say to her, I want to drink. And she goes, I want to drink too. And I go, oh, sweet, I live here. Let's go. Not a hesitate. Nope, that's it. Enough. We're gone. We leave the church. We walk to my buddy's house where, and we, we do a couple things and we walk back to the treatment center like nothing had happened. And we're upstairs in the didactic group, right? And I'm at that nice, warm, just getting started. Okay, it's going to be a good night spot. No idea how much we drank, but but I'm at that warm, cozy, if we could just figure out how to stay right here forever, I'd be good, right? That place, that's where I am, hanging out upstairs. And this didactic group is about to start, okay? And they're like, Stacy, you can't go to group. You can, they all know I drank, nobody cares, whatever. You know, even though we're in treatment, they all, you know, you cannot go to group. And I'm like, why? No, I'm good. I'm at that spot. I'm really good. And they're like, no, no, you cannot go to group. And I'm like, why not? 
And they're like, you are never this happy. That is what they said to me. You are never this happy. And it was like a light switch. I have, uh, I was not drunk enough to deal with the truth of that statement in that moment. And there was no way for me to get any more unless I blatantly walked out of treatment and decided to be homeless one more time. And, and I did. I walked out of treatment and decided to be homeless one more time because I had set off the phenomenon of craving and it was already set off. And that was the thing, right? When, when 823 of 2001, I relapsed and that's a longer story than I have to get into. Um, uh, but it was a relapse. It was a deliberate, yep, I'm going to drink it. I'm drinking at this thing. This, I can't deal with this thing and I'm going to drink at it. And it took me another eight years to get back. Uh, right. Like I set off the phenomenon of craving and it took me another eight and a half, nine years to, to get sober again after that first eight months. Um, so that, that piece right there, that, that is, that is the physical factor of alcoholism that I put alcohol into my system. Something chemically happens to me and I can't stop with just one or two. That is actually the only part of this disease that has anything to do with drinking. Everything else happens to me when I'm sober, right? Everything else. The main problem of my, the main center of my problem is in my head, right? And so two other things. The first thing is the obsession of the mind. I am obsessed with thinking about drinking. I, I think about it, right? And thank God this goes away. Thank God this goes away. But especially when we're new, I'm thinking about drinking, I see a commercial, I'm thinking about drinking. I go to a party there, I'm watching them drink, watch another, like all I can do is think about it, right? I love when new people come in or some people with some time and, and we go, oh my God, I'm thinking about drinking. I'm alcoholic. It's the only thing I've ever known in the solution to most of my problems since I was eight years old. Of course, I'm thinking about drinking. Like I'm not, you know, if we're new and we're thinking about, I'm not doing anything wrong because I'm thinking about drinking. I actually, uh, I work night shift. And so I was sleeping today and I had a drinking dream out of nowhere, had a drink. I'm 11 years sober. My life is, my life is cherries, cherries on top of cherry. I mean, there are rainbows coming out in my life right now. And I had a drinking dream and I'm like, oh, oh okay. Yay. Free first step. Like I no longer judge it. It's part of my disease, Right to think about drinking and it, and it's rare and in between today, it comes out in my dreams. I, I couldn't tell you the last time that I had that hold on to the edge of the table. Oh my God, I can't breathe. I want to drink. That's not what I'm, I mean, Oh no. Right. Just the random thought. Okay. Second thing is the delusion. And this one never goes away and it's directly attached to my character defects. And I am delusional. I, I will convince myself that you're wrong, I'm right, and it doesn't even have to be about drinking. It'll be about something else, right? I just need to work more. Oh, I should date that person. Blah, blah, blah. It's, it's delusional, right? Like I would be sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, listen to a speaker, and I would think it was really just the hard liquor. It, was, it, really, it really was just the hard liquor. If I could just you know, maybe drink beer takes too long. I'm so alcoholic, <laughs> right? I can't even get like two seconds into the rest of that thought, but like, and I would leave. I wouldn't tell anybody. I wouldn't tell in my head. I would leave and I would go out with this. I'm, I'm going to tie my drinks, right? Page 30 in the big book is a great description of, of the problem of alcohol, of the medical definition. Page 30 in the doctor's opinion of the medical definition of alcoholism in that like, uh, you know, I have this thought and it sets off the, the desire to want to drink, right? I'm obsessed. And then I believe the lie. The, the difference between a delusion and a lie is I believe the lie. And I convince myself this time will be different. I can get sober again tomorrow, right? I'm, I, I mean, unless you're really, really new, we all know somebody that, that was wrong about that statement right? We die. In droves, we die. So the point is, the only thing I'm powerless over is the thought. I'm powerless over the obsession. I'm powerless over the thought of drinking coming into my mind, right? That's it. I'm not powerless over whether or not I take a drink. 
I'm not powerless over whether or not I share the fact that I'm thinking about drinking. I'm not power. There are so many steps and actions that have to take place for me to actually physically drink. Like, I don't keep alcohol in my home. I, I, I don't care that you do or don't, you know, but I don't keep alcohol in my home. But I, but I would have to literally like get in my car, get the money, go to the store, get the bottle, drink, right? Like so many physical steps that actually physically have to take place for me to consume alcohol, right? Because I had a thought. And so this is what happened to me. I'm, I'm, I'm 27 years old doing the same thing I was always doing for 11 years, over a decade. Um, and I'm, I'm three days sober, five days sober, 10 days sober, whatever. And I drink again and I drink again. Cause you guys all go to work, right? I go to the noon meeting and you guys all go to work and I don't know what to do with myself. And I can't stay sober between the noon and the five 30. Just, I get a random thought and I go, and this guy comes up to me and he says, go get her number. And I followed that instruction and her name was Holly Dean. And she took me in and she put me in a cabin 45 minutes North of Grand Rapids. And we walked through this book, sentence by sentence, word for word. She said, this book is not to you or for you. It's about you. Let's find you. Right. Um, and, and we walked through the book. If it would, you know, like if there was a question mark, we answered the question. If it's in italics, it was written a really, really long time ago. They paid a lot of money to change the printing. It's important. Right. <laughs> like, and we walked through the book. And she set me up and I decided not to move back to Grand Rapids and I got a sober dog and I got an apartment and I got a job and all of the things, our lives get good really, really quick. Right. And I got all of the things and she helped me get all of the things. And we walked through the steps in this book and I have 89 days. I have 89 days sober. There were doilies on my furniture, right? The little white doilies, right? I didn't know what to do with those. You know, I come from like cardboard boxes and milk crates with, you know, candle wax spilled on them, right? Like, I'm like, what am I doing with these doilies? And I have 89 days sober. And I wake up that day. I didn't pray. I didn't go to a meeting and I didn't call anybody. I did not do one thing in that day to engage in a process of recovery for myself. I didn't do one thing. Um, and I'm standing in line at the grocery store and I'm buying $60 worth of groceries. And the obsession pops in. I call it the committee because they talk to me, right? The committee pops up, right? Obsession of the mind. And it goes, I know I'm just buying time again. Why am I buying all these perishables if I'm just going to leave? I put everything back but Pepsi and granola bars went home, packed everything that was hung in in its closet, didn't call anybody, didn't fight it at all, right? Believed it. I know I'm just buying time again. Why am I buying all these perishables if I'm just going to leave? Hung, 89 days sober. Packed everything, packed sober. I packed everything sober. And I'm driving to Georgia to see my sister. And by the time I'm in the, abandoned the dog, and by the time I'm in the car, 15 minutes later, I'm drunk and I'm driving to Georgia to see my sister. And I came to in Gainesville, Kentucky. And it wasn't the first time that I had come to in a random state and needed to know where I was, where I have to go through my pockets and figure out what state in the country I'm in, right? Where I live in Grand Rapids and I wake up and I'm in Wyoming, which is really far away, right? Alabama, Kentucky, like just come to one time. Wyoming is cold, it's in the mountains. And, uh, and I woke up because it was so cold that I had to scrape the inside of the windows of the car because the condensation from my breath had froze on the inside of the car. Like, thank God I'm alive, right? And I have to go through my pockets and look at gas receipts and figure out what physical state I'm in, you know? And so one more time, I wake up in some random hotel room in a different state that I don't even know what state I'm in. And I'm 27 years old and absolutely nothing in my life is different than it was at 27. I had doilies yesterday and today I'm choosing to live in my car again, right? And uh, I had been listening to speaker tapes, thank God for speaker tapes, because Holly had been giving them to me. And this woman named Beth had, I woke up and I heard her voice. And, and on her speaker tape, she says that she woke up and heard God's voice. And God said to her, people like you don't die, Beth. That's what she heard. 
And I woke up that morning in that hotel room and I heard the same voice. I, I heard her voice is what I heard. He was like, people are people like you don't die either, Stacy. And I knew, I knew I was going to wake up and be 37 and 47 and 57. And this was going to be my life. And I instantly knew it. And I called my mother and she said, go back. And I'm like, Holly's never going to talk to me again. And she said, go back anyway. And she sent me the money one more time. And I went back and I was gone for one day and I showed up at the Monday night meeting and I'm sitting on the back of my car and Holly comes up to me and she says, sick, sad, and sorry, here we are again. I have given you absolutely everything we have to offer. It is up to you whether or not you want to pick it up and use it, but no that this is the only place I have to go and you are killing people. And I saw it. I saw it for the first time. I knew exactly what she meant. She, I, I might not be the girl that's going to die tomorrow, but the girl sitting next to me is going to sell herself, her delusion. Well, Stacy made it back and she's going to believe that and she's not going to make it back. And I knew, I knew it was the truth. I knew that it didn't matter that I wasn't by the door, that my behavior and my actions affected other people. And these people had given me everything, absolutely everything. And I have a random thought in a grocery store and I abandoned it all. And I saw it for the first time. The only thing I'm powerless over is the thought. That's it. I'm not powerless over the action. And I haven't had a drink since. Um, so now some really cool stories. Yay, right? Because I got sober and my life got good, man. Oh my God, my life is amazing. Yeah, so uh, Holly, Holly passed away. I was 22 months sober. She died of fourth stage colon cancer. Um, quick, she died quick. Uh, like November, she got diagnosed and she passed away in May. The day she died, I uh, painted her toenails and raked her yard because you guys taught me how to be a service. You know, uh, I was present and available and there was not one thing that I owed in that relationship. I did it for fun and for free. Um, and there was not one, you know, not one part of me that was going to drink over my sponsor dying. Now I did go a little sponsor list for a while and people would say to me, you should get another sponsor. And I would go, eh, my sponsor died. Good. Thank you. I'm going to go pick up these girls. And I would just pick up these random girls and drive around and take them to a bunch of meetings. Cause you know, I'm like almost two thinking I know something. Um, and so Holly died and I, and I, I, I don't do what I'm supposed to do or what, whatever, you know, grief is grief. Um, and I, I lose the job I had. And because I lost, I, I lost the job and I was still living 45 minutes in the country, like, like 45 minutes North of the Grand Rapids. And so the job that I got was like the only job in my field up there. And I couldn't find another job and I couldn't afford the rent. And my mom said, come home. The man was gone. My sisters, got, my mom said, come home. And so I did reluctantly, very reluctantly, I went home. And so I moved back with, in with my mother who I hadn't lived with since seventh grade. And at this point in time, I'm, I'm not quite 30. Right. Um, and thank God for that time. Thank God for that time. I lived with my mother for six years and, um, at, at the end of all of that, and my family got mended in that time, in that time, my grandfather, um, and my grandmother moved in with us and my grandfather died on in hospice in, in our living room. And what happened with that is, um, the hospice nurse and, and my mom, and my sister are having this argument about the level of care that my grandfather needs, right? Because my, because whatever, the drugs in the house and blah, blah, blah. And so they're having this argument that he needs more medication, my sister and my mother. And, um, and I'm sitting on the couch, not saying anything, because you guys taught me that present and available does not mean speak. <laughs> nobody's asking for my opinion right and I'm sitting on the couch and this hospice nurse comes up to me or he goes hey what about her like he asks my opinion the hospice nurse and my mother puts up her hand and says she's whatever I need and my mother used to call the north club and to see if I was alive she would call the north club and say hey have you seen Stacy and because if, if I was going to meetings at least she knew I was alive and today I'm whatever she needs. And, and moving to Bay City, moving back home with my mom was like the worst thing that I thought could happen at two years sober with a dead sponsor and all of that. And oh my God, the time, 
the time of coffee, the time of, you know, whatever. My sister still has contact with, um, with the abusive side of my childhood, right? It's her dad. Why wouldn't she, you know? In her mind, it's her dad. And so, you know, and he mailed Christmas cookies to the house one year. And my mom came to me and said, that man will never mail one more thing into this house. Don't worry about it. I got it. You know, and so she didn't, you know, she didn't believe me when I was a kid, but today all of that is mended, but it took six years. It took six years of day in and day out and coffee and conversations and, and, and just being present and me not necessarily saying every thought that comes into my head, right? And just being present and available. And today my family is mended, you know, um, so I, uh, I'm living with my mom. I'm going back to school. I'm going to set the scene real quick. Cause it's a really good story. And I'm about four, I'm about four years sober, right? I'm going to trauma therapy cause it was time and I needed outside help for those things. Right. I did. Um, I, I, I'm doing all this stuff. My life, I got a new sponsor. My life is taking off. I got all these sponsees, all of this stuff. Right. And, uh, um, I'm angry. I'm still so like bristle with antagonism at God, right? Like now God and I are better than we've ever been because I could see God. I could see God working from seventh grade to 17 and being in residential treatment and keeping me off of the streets and giving me this childhood that was the best childhood I could have at the time, right? I could see God in that and getting me out of that house. And I could see God at 17 to 27 drinking in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and being spared. You guys taking me in and doing the things that you did. And all I can see God in that. And I can definitely see God from 27 to what, 32, however old I was, right? Because my life is taken off and it's beautiful. And I can't see God from three to 12. And I'm so angry. I'm so angry and my problem and my solution become the same thing again. Cause if I'm mad at God, I don't have to pray. And if I'm not praying, then I'm alone with me. Right. The whole point is to tap into this inner resource and we don't care what you call God. We don't care, you know, and, and, and I'm mad, I'm mad and I have this resentment. And so fabulous sponsorship. My sponsor says, sweet, write a four step. You're mad, write a four step. Do it directly on God. Do it directly on that childhood stuff. I'm doing trauma therapy. And so I'm writing this four step. And God is number one on the resentment list. Where was he? What was he doing? Why wasn't he paying attention to me? That's what I'm mad about, right? And I can't find the fourth column. Can't do it. Nine months, I sit on this four step in this formatting. And I cannot move on to resentment too, which was my mother, right? Can't, can't move on to resentment too. Cause I, cause I, you gotta go across and then down. My sponsor was so mad. Stacy, just set it down and write about everything else. We'll get to the fourth column, right? Formatting the nine months on, on defiant, right? Okay. So that's, that's, that's the step work I'm working on. That's the resentment I'm working on. And my life is taking off and God is being so good. And my family's being mended and I get a new job and I'm going back to school and I have all these sponsees and I'm in sponsor. I mean, going to all these conferences and we're going all around and I'm starting to speak and all of this stuff, amazing, amazing life. Right. Right. And um, we're going to these conferences and I'm hearing these speakers talk about this stuff. And this one woman gets up there and she talks about a being powerless over a clear liquid, glass of vodka, powerless over a clear liquid, to the fact that she abandoned her children, powerless over, a clear, had that much power over her to abandon her children. And the obsession of that clear liquid let her abandon her children. And how is that obsession any different than his obsession with me? really and it takes this resentment and it goes from here just a little just a little right and then this other woman gets up there and she talks about flicking an ant and the ant is a snow or a snowflake right flicking a snowflake or an ant and it makes a snowball and it goes and it goes and it goes and it's an avalanche right and now we have this avalanche of snow because i flicked a snowflake right and a lot of people got caught up in my avalanche 
and a, and I got caught up in some other people's. And it takes this resentment from just a little, just a little bit, right? This woman, this woman I'm really good friends with, her husband passed away out of nowhere. Her husband passed away. And this guy calls her and says, there are a lot of things in this world that make God really, really sad too. And so uh, do I have a God that's sad with me about the things that happened to me? Or do I have a God that caused them? Get a new concept of God. And it takes this resentment just inch by inch over the course of this nine months that I'm, these things are happening. This is all hindsight, right? And this is what's happening. And, and I'm getting these little nuggets, you know? And so it's like, oh, side note, I'm trying to go to nursing school so that I can become a travel nurse to go be a travel nurse all over the country. That's the plan. Okay. But I don't have the money. I drank it all in my twenties. I switched schools a million times. I'm completely out of financial aid. I don't have the money for nursing school. And so this is, that's the other part of my life that's happening. And so I get out of work and I'm talking to Jesse again about this same resentment again, right? And she's like, Stacy, the instructions don't change. Just put it down and write about everything else. We'll get to it. And then she says this thing to me, you're the only one in the middle of the field with the gun. Your fourth column is that you're holding on to this resentment. The same way, the only thing that I'm powerless over is the thought. I'm going to cuddle and hold on and die on my sword to the things that happened to me 40 years ago, right? You're the only one in the middle of the field with the gun. They've all gone home. Put it down and write about everything else. That's, that's my mistake, is continuing to feed into it and listen to it and play the tape and giving it power. That's my, that's my part. Right. And I go home and I go to bed and I wake up six hours later to an email that treatment center that I got sent to as a kid, they gave me a scholarship and paid for my entire nursing tuition. They paid for room books, board. They paid for it all. I got a full ride scholarship to nursing school in a day. Same day, I go to bed. Okay, God, take it. I'm so tired. Take it. I don't care what it means, right? Because this spectacular inner resource, the reason I don't tap into it is because I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. The presence of God on me, the presence of God inside of me, I've never known that pure love and intimacy. It scares me. It still scares me today a little bit. And the only way through that fear is to walk through it, is to embrace it, right? They paid for all in nursing school. God was showing off that day. Because if nothing would have happened to me, if nothing would have happened to me from three to 12, I wouldn't have landed in that treatment center. And I wouldn't have had the opportunity to have that scholarship 20 years later is the reality of this. I can't see around the bend. I have no idea what God's doing, you know? Um, so I became a nurse. Yay, I passed. Crazy, can't believe it. I'm dyslexic, can't spell to save my life, but I did, I'm a nurse. Um, and I became a travel nurse. So I could go to AA all over the country. And so I decide to go be a travel nurse and I leave my home and my meetings and my, my I, I do long distance sponsorship at the time. So it didn't really matter, but I'm going to go. We're going to go venture out and go to AA all over the country. Yay. February 20th of 2020, I leave. And the country shuts down and COVID hits on March 15th of 2020. And I become a COVID nurse overnight. And I'm not an ICU nurse. I'm one step down. There's a lot of levels to hospital care. And I'm, I'm just below, just below ICU. And so they pull me to the ICU to help the ICU nurses. And I get all of the patients that we are not going to intubate and we are not going to save. I get those. And I get to just watch people paraglide into death. One 12-hour shift, we lost eight people. Um. 12 hours, eight people. And uh, so I'm drowning. I'm eight years sober. I'm, I'm away from everybody I know and meeting shut down and thank God for service and thank God I'm in the middle, right? Like I got taught how to travel in sobriety. And so I had people in St. I was in St. Louis, Missouri and I, I had people and Mike McCain, I don't know if you guys know him. He's really big in the speaker taper world. He's passed away now. He actually died of COVID last year. Um, but 
he 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 picked he I knew him and he uh he put me right on Zoom. I, I got to teach Polly. Some guy was talking about not being computer literate, right? I got to teach Polly Pistol how to use Zoom, you know, on the phone. Okay, honey, left click. No, the other left, the other left, left click. Right. I mean, and being a service, right? Like, and and that woman is a giant in my eyes. You know, she's amazing and the kindest, most she's so gentle, right? Um and so, I, but I'm drowning. I mean, I'm in the middle of service and I jump in the middle and you guys taught me how to do that. And I know how to do that. But when I'm alone, I'm drowning and I'm, and I'm dreading going to work and one more person is going to die. And, and I, I don't know that I'm not going to catch this. And I mean, the, I don't know, I, I know how it was where I was, right. But the things that you saw in the news and the things that it, it was real, that was, it was absolutely real. And people were dying in droves and it was military grade kind of PTSD ward, like, uh, right. And, um, and nothing we could do, nothing we could do. And, um, and so I, I start calling my people and I start doing the thing and this, and my friend, my good friend, she told me to call this woman named Deb. Call this woman named Deb. She works in emergency management. She'll hook you up, call her. And yay that I got no problems telling on my head today right? Because I know I'm delusional. I know I can't see around the curve. I know that it's fear and noise and my alcoholism doesn't let me see through it. I need you. I need God with skin on. I need the clarity, right? Like left turn a little bit here. I'm so delusional that when I finally got sober, I didn't know I was homeless living in my car. And Holly sits me down and she says, where's your toothbrush? And I'm like, Oh, it's in the glove box of my car. D nope, didn't know. I was right, so freaking delusional. Okay. And so I call Deb and I puke on her. And at the time, she's driving across the country. And you gotta love, Deb's got like 35 years sober. You gotta love these old timers, right? Because her reply to me of my pukage, of all of my problems in the middle of COVID and blah, 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 right? All of it eh, on her is, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> we've just started a prayer and meditation group on zoom. Would you commit to doing 20 minutes of meditation a day on a specific prayer and meet us on Tuesdays at two and, and tell us what you got through the week. And my, oh man. Yeah. Cause I need to sit and be more quiet. Right. Cause I can, I can, t I can stand the voices in my head yelling at me about this fear. Right. Yes. And okay. If you hear nothing else from me, if you're struggling, if you, if you hear nothing else, yes and okay, because I don't know. Okay. And do it anyway. Do it kicking and screaming. Do it grumpy. Just do it. Right? Yes and okay. And I do it. And I dive into 20 minutes of meditation. Now, I will tell you that Holly had set me up. When I was new, she, I had this to-do list and in the beginning, and she would say, go to the fridge, get a bottle of water, sit on the couch, drink the bottle of water. And I started prayer and meditation with a bottle of water, no smoking, no caffeine, no Facebook, no computer, no TV, just sit there, breathe God in, love out, drink the bottle of water. You have to do it till you drink the bottle of water. So if you drink it faster, okay, guess you're done with the meditation for the day just practice just the only thing that matters about god and prayer is to start and continue start and continue it's a practice right so 20 minutes and so by that time i had worked my way up set the alarm on the phone two minutes five minutes ten minutes so she asked she's asking me to do 20 minutes and i gotta tell you guys i do 20 minutes and i want 20 minutes more because my head shut up my head shut up and I get to sit in this peace and this love and this, I'm okay. And it's going to be okay. And I can walk in and hang out with these people. And, and I get these visions of death and life. And so I don't know if you've ever seen a baby be born and all these people are in the room and this baby's being born and there's not a dry eye in the room when a baby's being born. It's so freaking beautiful, right? And there's people on the other side, believe it. I, I mean, there's people on the other side waiting for us to be born there. It's just a stomping ground. Death is part of life. And I get to be the transition in between. I get to hold somebody's hand and I get to pray for them if they want me to pray for them. And I get to be present and available for that person in that moment. And I am perfectly educated and perfectly okay. And the trauma that I've experienced in my life lets me be separate, right? 
The trauma that I've experienced in my childhood lets me be focused in this moment to do this career that is absolutely amazing. And it's all a gift from you guys. I didn't know how to be present and available. I didn't know how to accept the presence of God to be able to help people pass the other side because we're all just scared that we're wrong, right? We're all just scared we're going to be alone. We're all just scared that it's going to be bad because it's unknown. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's coming around. And the only answer to that is faith, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's what I get to do today. And thank God it's, it's, it's going back down and it's okay. And not as many people are dying. People are still dying, but not as many, right? Um, and that's what I got. I dove into 11 and my 11th step took off. It took, and it's grown. And now I'm, I'm up to an hour and I do an hour on a regular basis of just quiet. It's my favorite thing to do. It's so, I can't even tell you how peaceful it is. Um, so that happened. I left St. Louis, Missouri and came and saw Deb because she lives in Akron, Ohio. Okay. She lives in Akron, Ohio. And I came and saw Deb and, uh, and she, uh, and so I'm coming here all the time in between contracts and I'm, my sponsor lives 30 minutes away. And that was just a random coincidence that my sponsor is really close to Akron also, and just random coincidences. And they're like, Stacy, you're floundering. You have no, you know, yeah, you have like zoom home group and I'm traveling the country being a travel nurse. Right. They're like, you got to get some roots. You got to get some roots. Let's settle down. Why don't you buy a house? And I'm like, you know, I got itchy feet. I've always traveled. No, no, no. You know, all I don't want to, whatever, all this stuff. And so I agree to buy a house. I'm like, okay, I'll get pre-approved, which, cause I didn't think it was going to happen. It totally happened. Who knew? Right. Uh, and, um, it's, I, I didn't know, I didn't come from any of that. Right. Like the stuff that I have today, I pinch myself all the time that this is my life. You know, I was hoping to maybe have a car and a job and a place to live with like maybe a washer and dryer in the apartment would have been nice. Yeah, like, like those were my goals, right? Like, uh, uh, no idea, you know, and, and, and all from you guys off. I'm going to go left a little bit. Sorry. And, and I, and I know I'm almost at time, but like you literally taught me how to do everything. They taught me how to go to school. Like I did nursing school in that six years I was living with my mother as my grandfather is dying in my living room and, and I'm doing trauma therapy and I'm walking through that resentment. I'm also doing nursing school, right? Like that, just because I had that day, they paid for nursing school. I didn't wake up like with this awareness of it. You know, I'm still, it time, time takes time, you know? Uh, and, um, and I'm, I, I like, I lost that train of thought. Nope. No idea where that went. So we're going to go back now. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy a house in Akron. I'm going to buy a house in Akron. And so I I'm clicking, I'm looking like on the, the housing market stuff and all of that. And I get a, I get a realtor. I don't mean to get a realtor. I get this realtor. Right. And her name is Grace Powers. And I'm like, okay, God, yay. Thanks for the, you know, like little nuggets. Okay. Her name's Grace Powers. That's my realtor. Good to know. Okay. Maybe I'm supposed to buy a house. And so we're jumping through all these hoops and we're doing all this stuff. And I, I'm on these runs like nursing and we do a lot of shifts in a row and I'm on these runs. And so I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan and Akron, Ohio is about four hours South of that. And so I have four days off. I have four days off in a row, sleepy, tired night shift. And I drive to Akron to meet with this realtor to look at houses. And my friend Deb, she speaks a lot is in Texas at a conference speaking. Okay. And she buys a lake house. She, she puts in a bid in from Texas, puts in a bid on a lake house and buys the lake house, wins the bid for this lake house. And so she comes home, I'm looking at houses in Akron. She comes home and is like, Hey, I bought a lake house. And I go, does that mean your house comes up for sale? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, Oh, I don't have to look for any more house. I'm by your house. And I, and so this woman that I called in the middle of COVID when that, like, they said, call this woman. I bought her house. And so I have a five bedroom, two and a half bath colonial with hardwood. It's freaking gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. A mile from Dr. Bob's house. My kitchen table was built by an old timer and it's lined with coins from Dr. Bob's grave. People come and stay here and live here and do AA in Akron, Ohio, because it's just me, you know? So if you're ever in the United States and you're ever in Akron, please come and have a room because it's a gift. And I cannot believe that this is my life.
and and I get to do all of that. Um, I like to end with this story. Uh, I can't see around the curve. I don't know what God's doing. I just know that he loves me. And if I can just accept the intimacy and the love, if I can just sit all the way down in the presence and I get that presence in multiple places, that moment of silence that we take, just that deep breath. If it's uncomfortable for you, sweet. It means you're feeling the presence of God. Embrace it, right? Because all it is is unknown and it's fear. And I just don't know. I have never had any experience with it. Why would I know, you know? Um, and so I say two things. My name is Stacey and I'm an alcoholic and I'm grateful for another day. I'm not trying to get sober again because I did that for a really, really long time. And the things that I have walked through in sobriety, dog dying, my sponsor dying, losing a job, COVID, my grandfather, I mean, death and fires and jobs and people and life, just life. Nothing's as bad as like two days sober, man sitting on the edge of the table, sweat, like that internal, oh my God, I can't breathe. I want to drink. Nothing is that bad. And if I don't drink, I don't set off the phenomenon of craving. It's that simple, you know? Um, so I, I'm grateful for another day. I'm not trying to get sober again. And then the other thing that I say is, um, is I'm grateful you guys keep talking about a solution. Because in and out, in and out, in and out, and you never kicked me out. You never said, don't come back. You just said, yeah, like, just stay. Just stay. You know, you took me in, you put me up, you let me wash my clothes. You spared me. You spared me from 12 years of alcoholic, like, madness that could have happened of living on the streets in Grand Rapids. And I treated your program like a joke, and I was wrong. Thank you so much for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.